I'm Roger Berkowitz, for those who don't know me, uh, and I'm founder and, and director here at the Hanna Arendt Center, and thrilled to welcome you all to the first of the Courage to Be dinners uh, for this uh, 2018 semester. Um, the Courage to Be program is now, I guess, in its fourth year. Uh, is that right? Fourth year? Third year? Fourth year? Fourth year. Uh, and it started through a conversation, I just want to mention it, with uh, uh, Nicholas Lewis, who probably none of you remember at this point, who um, was here just for two years, uh, and was designed, was, was tasked, he, was a, he has a divinity degree, now back at Yale Divinity School, and was tasked with um, uh, thinking about ways to create community at Bard. And so um, he and I sat down and figured if we could come up with some ideas for the divinity program, the theology program at Bard and the RN Center to work together. And we started talking about what we thought were the core issues of our time. Um, and we talked a lot about the lack of faith today and the fact that there's not something some center that many people believe in for which they would stand up for or sacrifice or um, in a sense allow themselves in some way to be hurt or sacrifice their lives for an idea they believed in, this, this idea of courageous action. Um, and, and why does one act courageously? Why does one resist the Nazis? Why does one, uh, why does one stand up and resist corporate malfeasance or something along those lines? What makes somebody um, act as an individual uh, and put their life on the line. And, and this is a, a very difficult question, and it's one that Hannah Arendt uh, spent a lot of time thinking about. She, she escaped Nazi Germany. She saw many of her friends collaborate, including her, one of her mentors, Martin Heidegger. Um, and, uh, and, and then she wrote uh, when, and saw the trial of Eichmann, Adolf Eichmann in, in Jerusalem, and, and gave a lot of thought to why is it that um, people uh, simply uh, do or don't? What makes it so that somebody does or doesn't um, resist or courageously resist evil? And, and there's not one answer to this, but one view is that it's a character issue for her. It just comes down to character. But you have to have something you believe in. And there are people who have that belief that they can't be otherwise and if they did this and went along with something, they wouldn't be who they were. And there are people who don't. And she was very aware that, even though she herself was not religious, she was very aware that um, the loss of religion made it increasingly less likely that people would have that kind of belief. And, uh, and so it was this question of how do you have courage in an age after religion. Not to say that religion is dead or anything like that. But when religion is no longer the same kind of publicly acknowledged force that it was for many years, for, for many centuries, how do we imbue moral and political courage in a population? And we thought creating a course around these questions, a series of courses and lecture series, uh, would be a way to do that. And, and that's very much the genesis of the Courage to Be courses. So uh, we're now in the fourth year. I'm thrilled that you're all decided to take one of these Courage to Be courses. And one of the great benefits is we uh, have these lectures uh, series uh, where we bring in people who have thought about and uh, exemplified this idea of moral and political courage uh, in their lives. And we have a series of Courage to Be fellows, students, um, who are here. And they are going, they've, helped, they've actually all selected the speakers in the series and they will be introducing them throughout the semester, so you'll get to meet them as well. Uh, and so today, my job is very simple. Uh, first of all, I want to just tell you a little bit of some coming events uh, at the RN Center. I'm sure many of you know that Chelsea Manning is going to speak on Wednesday. If you don't have a ticket, um, you can arrive at 5 o'clock at the Fisher Center and put yourself on a waiting list, and I'm confident there will be some tickets that uh, emerge. But it starts at 6 o'clock on Wednesday at the Fisher Center. Um, David Bromwich, who's a fantastic uh, public intellectual and history professor at Yale, um, is giving a, a talk on Thursday, February 22nd, Bad Art, Its Cause and Cure, which will, I think, be hysterically interesting and fun. 
I hope you can make that. And then uh, a week from today, on Monday the 26th, there'll be a small dinner discussion at the RN Center with Ann Nelson, uh, who's a wonderful writer, on her book, Nazi Berlin and Paris, Lessons in Resistance. It's actually very related to the Courage to Be uh, theme. It's not an official lecture, it's gonna be a smaller event, but I hope you uh, will come to that. If you want to, please email uh, Tina Stanton, RN at bar.edu, and we'll reserve you a spot. And then uh, on March 5th, the second lecture is Sylvia Sumter. Uh, but you'll hear more about that. So for now, let me introduce one of our Courage to Be Fellows, someone who spent a lot of time working with the Hiring Center in the last two years since she's been at Bard, uh, Isabella Sintel. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Roger. Good evening, everyone. I have the great pleasure of introducing Doug Manue. Doug Manue has courageously stood at the North Pole. He has crossed the Sahara, had tea with Stalin's daughter, and held a chunk of Einstein's brain. Quitting his blues band in 1981, he began his career freelancing for Time, Life, Newsweek, Fortune, USA Today, The New York Times Magazine, and many other publications. His subjects span across a wide range of courageous individuals, such as AIDS orphans in Uganda, Amazon lepers, famine and conflict survivors in Sudan, President Clinton, Mother Teresa, and Steve Jobs. Doug titled his fourth book, Fearless Genius, The Digital Revolution in Silicon Valley, 1985 to 2000. It became a number one bestseller on Amazon's photo book list and is now available in six countries in 17 different languages. This was a perfect book for Doug because he is fearless. His work as a documentary photographer inspires us to continue chasing that which gives our lives meaning. Not only does photojournalism require courage, it also freezes in time a moment of courage. And Doug has a natural talent for capturing incredibly moving moments of courage through his own lens. I've known Doug for the past 20 years of my life. He is my uncle, and I'm incredibly fortunate to have an uncle like Doug. Despite our fights at the Thanksgiving table, Doug has always driven me to fight for what I believe in and remain passionate and courageous throughout all the trials life has thrown at me. Now, I'm very excited for Doug to share these stories of courage with you tonight. Thank you, Izzy, for that beautiful introduction. Not totally fearless. <laughs> if I have a camera in my hand, I'll do anything. But thank you for that. And you were always right in those arguments at dinner. And thank you to Roger so much and Tina and everyone at the center for inviting me. This is a great honor for me. And it's a subject, <clears throat> I have to say, it actually took a lot of courage for me to come here tonight and talk about a subject I haven't thought that deeply about before. Um, I'm not an academic, I'm not a scholar, um, but what the hell, a lack of knowledge has never stopped me before from talking. And frankly, it doesn't matter because I have pictures. You know, when I was a kid, my dad used to make fun of me. He used to say, you've never been to China, but you're going to tell me all about it, aren't you? And I would think about that and realize, oh yeah, shallow, a lot of shallow knowledge. Experience has taught me, though, um, over the years, that, and I have been to China many times since then, but what the experience of travel and going into different cultures and different countries over the years has taught me is that actually it's possible to visit another country and another culture <clears throat> and learn very little. And I kind of realized, actually, that I know nothing, which is a good place to start from if you really want to learn something, it turns out. So... I have tried to cultivate that attitude of traveling and, and photographing with a curious uh, mind and humility and basically beginner's mind, as they say in Zen practice. Um, it's, really, it's really important. So let me just show you a few of the pictures she referred to. Um, I was the 3013th person to stand at the North Pole. It was Before I get to the courage pictures, I'll just show you some background. Um, it also was the last time I think I blacked out the Russians, the vodka. It's all there. It's all true. <laughs> <laughs> they force you. This is uh, I crossed the Sahara to uh, in Sudan to get to Ethiopia. I was traveling up the Amazon with a group of doctors, and we stumbled into a leper colony where thirty thousand lepers had been abandoned by the government, rounded up and abandoned. I cover everything from the homeless crisis to the AIDS crisis. 
I shot a lot of sports, five Super Bowl, <laughs> Super Bowls, the Olympics. Um, this is the famine in Ethiopia she referred to. This, um, you know, at, by the time I shot this story in 1985, I was pretty used to seeing death and horror, but this project, this was just, you come into a camp and there's 100,000 people and they've walked 10 days out of this uh, battle zone to get to this camp and there's no food and people are just dying all around you while you're taking pictures. And, you know, I was a month there and the thing about it was the scale of the suffering really impacted me and it changed my life and I came back and I really had a kind of crisis about what I could possibly contribute, what could I do with my camera. So, and I started looking for more positive stories about the human race and what, what could, and that led me into technology, which is another story. I'll show you a few of my technology pictures. Um, but, you know, I've shot presidents. You mentioned Clinton um, and a lot of movie stars. And Charlize Theron, actually, I threw her in because I was with her in the Congo uh, where she was working with Jane Goodall. And, uh, oh, I, I took that picture out. Sorry, Jane's not here. <laughs> so Charlize, I don't know how much you know about her, but what she's really interested in and what she really spends a lot of time doing is working in the eastern Congo with rape victims. And she goes into one of the most dangerous war zones in the world. She also has a nonprofit in South Africa for AIDS education and AIDS. She was there, we were there with Jane Goodall, so she could learn Jane's unbelievable um, knowledge and wisdom and skill set around running nonprofits. And, um, and that was quite an experience to be able to be listening to them argue over a fire and whiskey every night. I spent four years documenting. Mexican culture by using tequila as the kind of linchpin or the thing that links together so many different cultures within Mexico. Um, and it's the oldest alcohol in the hemisphere. It's over 9,000 years it's been cultivated. And it really is one of the few things that does tie a country together that is so different in many ways. You go over one mountain range, there's another language. There's over 2 million people speaking Nahuatl. There's just a lot you can learn about Mexico through tequila that, as I said, I thought I knew Mexico because so I've been going down there for 20 years as a journalist. It turns out I really did know nothing, less than nothing. <laughs> but tequila helped me. Uh, I can't drink it anymore, but it was great. So. My last book was on AIDS orphans in Uganda. Um, it was a really incredible experience. I'll show you some of those pictures in a minute. Liz Taylor wrote the intro. I've been all around the world, Vietnam, China, Dubai, uh, probably 200,000 miles a year for 30 years. And guess what? It's a really big world I haven't seen. There's still many places to go. So to the topic at hand, courage. You know, after I was invited to speak, I realized I was a bit overconfident. I hadn't really delved into this subject. And I was talking with Tina earlier. I did learn from my subjects about courage. I just didn't know it. And I think the way it affected me was when I would photograph somebody in a situation where I would witness acts of courage, it probably just impacted me in terms of my own behavior, almost like osmosis where you see how it's possible to act with complete grace and it's just something to aim for. But anyway, I went to the dictionary. I started at the basics and this is pretty clear, you know, it's like the ability to do something that frightens one she called in all her courage to face the ordeal. Strength in the face of pain or grief. He fought his illness with great courage. But you know, courage seems to me to exist on a continuum. From all that I've seen, it feels like there's different degrees of courage. You know, there's everyday courage standing up for someone at school or at work, all the way up to risking your life to save a life or in a conflict or facing your own death, probably the highest, I think, you talk about, Roger talks about different types of courage, spiritual, moral, physical. Um, but I think the degree of courage required increases with the level of risk you are taking with the act of courage um, in a given situation. Its catalyst is fear. And it could just be fear of rejection, fear of failure, losing your job, fear of humiliation, loss of status, but it could also be fear of death. And I think ultimately courage is tied to death and our fear of it. And it's rooted in our character. I think you mentioned that earlier. But I really think um, 
you see that when you're witnessing people act with courage, it just feels like it's, it's part of your character. It requires a decision and, you know, it could be, you know, you have to choose to act. And this could be instantaneous, it could be immediate, in which case um, you may have some deeply held convictions. I will save this person in this burning car now without even thinking about it, or ideas about what is right and wrong and right action. You know, other times it could be painful consideration, but you have to decide to act. You might take a while, but if you have thought about who you are, what you believe in, and developed your character, it's a lot easier to sort of pre-decide based on the value system you've already evolved. And uh, so it's easier to make those kinds of decisions. You're willing to take the risk no matter what because you believe in this. This is really, really hard. <laughs> this is really hard. But I think um, at its most profound level, I think courage really is about death because ultimately, I think for me anyway, in the back of my head, it's always about who am I, why am I here? I answer that question by taking pictures. That's how I figure out who I am and my place in the world. And it's sort of like understanding that by what I have in common or what I'm, what's different about me with my subjects. And it gives me an orientation. And I think that if you think about these things and you go through the Socratic method about who you are, you can define your values and it, it's a lot easier to act with courage probably. This is... Uh, so let me show you some of the pictures, some of the faces of people that have gone through things that I've photographed. This is an artist I met during an assignment. It lasted a year, and it was about PSP, which is a debilitating brain disease. You know, you lose your cognition, you lose your physical ability to move, your nervous system. It's just Alzheimer's on steroids. It's just a horrible disease. People are lucid even if they can't express themselves. Um, and I met a lot of different people suffering from this. And the idea was they wanted me to come into their lives. They opened their homes. They opened their families. And they wanted, to, they wanted me to be a witness and share these stories. And um, you know, there's a foundation trying to raise money so they can cure this disease. But this, um, I think anybody with a, with a fatal illness like this is going to face just the ultimate that guy, the previous guy, he's a doctor, actually. So he knew exactly what was happening to him, pretty much. And he talked to me about it. And his wife was his primary caregiver, as it was with this gentleman. They've all passed away since then. So last year, I lost two friends, and two very close friends. The first one was uh, Michael, whose son is seen here digging his father's grave on their farm upstate. I had never seen that before. Um, you know, a life well lived means fewer regrets at the end, which is, I'm just going to read you what I wrote about him when he died. Um, that was how my friend Michael put it to me when he told me he was dying. He said he'd be dead by Christmas, and he was okay with that. He'd had a good run, he said. Michael was a fighter. He fought like hell to build his career from nothing to the pinnacle. As a gay man who survived the AIDS pandemic in San Francisco in the 80s, and as a father who adopted two brothers from a deeply troubled home, he fought for those boys till the end, one of whom is, you see here. And he fought for hell, like hell for eight years to defy the disease that finally took him down, all while giving his love, wisdom, and support to a legion of devoted friends. Six months ago, he was giddy with the news that alternative treatments he'd received in Germany seemed to have worked. His New York doctors could find no sign of the tumor. Ruthless and cruel, the cancer came rushing back, secretly pulsing like black venomous smoke through his bloodstream. He wanted to be buried on his farm, and he left instructions for a traditional Irish wake and funeral. They dressed him in special burial clothes and laid him out for friends and family to say goodbye. An elegant pine casket was handmade by a close friend, and people flew in from all over to share a beautiful, artful celebration. Whiskey flowed, music played, and bonfires burned away our grief. And I'm going to spare you the further pictures that I did of his death. I did an actual traditional death mask, but it's hard to show that one. My other friend who died, Harlan, who um, was one of the most alive people I, I've ever met. He started the Longworth Theater in Connecticut when he was 19 years old and went on to be, have a huge career as a producer in Hollywood and ran Queen Martin Studios and MGM and, and then got into tech and fundraising. He was also a character. Um, but the best political arguments I ever heard were at his dinner table. 
And shortly before the end, I wasn't there, but I heard he was cracking jokes uh, despite the pain. And uh, it just made me think about the courage of facing your own death and what that would be. And I think there's this, this sort of connection between courage and grace. And I think in case of a fatal illness, what I've seen is that if you act with courage in the face of pain or impending death, you exhibit grace, grace under pressure, really. And this is something we all probably aspire to, but if you can do it, it gives you automatically a kind of dignity and self-respect, it seems to me. It also helps those around you deal with the situation. It signals your sacrifice in the sense that you care about them and the people who care about you, and rather than get into fear of death and the unknown, which is only natural, you fight to stay present. And it's not always possible to the end, but anyway, how hard is that? I think that, again, you're making an existential decision to assign your life meaning through your behavior. By acting with courage, you believe your life has meaning. You, you're, this is how you do it. It's simply because you decide that it has meaning and acting in accord with what you consider to be right action that makes it meaningful. And a good death implies a life well lived. So this is about dangerous fishing. This is on the north coast of Brazil in Serra. And um, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse when I'm doing this program, but for those of you at home, I'm about to curse, if that's okay. (laughs) These fishermen go out on these crazy boats that are really unsafe, and they're just traditional boats that have been there for hundreds of years. And they go out for three or four days on the Atlantic swells, and there's nowhere to really sit down or lay down. They, have to, they pile the fish on, and they kind of sleep on the fish, and they come back. And every few months, somebody dies. Somebody drowns. And, um, it's, but they're heroic. They're legendary. They're called Jancanderos. And Orson Welles went down in the 1940s, and he went specifically to this village to, photo, to do a film about these guys. And he actually, well, I, that's another story. I think we don't have time. Um, <laughs> so... I said to, I went out on the boat, I got a few hundred yards out, and I'm hanging on with one hand, I'm shooting pictures with one hand, it's like, take me back, take me back to the beach, I'm so proud. You know, this is it, this is it, give me back, give me back. So they're laughing at me, and they take me back, and I said to the guy, this is really dangerous, this is really, really dangerous, how do you even do this? And he goes, oh, we have a saying for that. Well, I was actually down there collecting proverbs uh, called, for a project called The Wisdom of Brazil, which someday I hope to finish. Anyway. He says, we have a saying for that. I'm like, wait, wait, let me, let me get my camera. We were videotaping, and he goes, o passarinho come Pedro sabe o cuque tem, which literally translates to the bird that eats the stone knows his own asshole. <laughs> I was like, wait, this is why I will never understand your culture. <laughs> let me get this straight. You mean he wouldn't eat the stone if he couldn't shit the stone? Exactly. I think this Me Too movement, you know, my mom, when I was 10, became a radical feminist and announced and explained to me, this is the dishwasher, this is the dryer, this is the stove. Um, I'm going to go to college to get my degree that I dropped out because of you. (laughs) And I'll see you in six months. Take care of your brothers and your sisters. And that's how she raised me, which was great. Thanks, Mom. Um, But watching what she went through just gives me such an appreciation of the Me Too movement now, and I just think it's fantastic. This is good news from Africa. This was actually a transformational story about the power of arts and education. These kids, they get, um, they do a dance tour every two years in the U.S. and it allows them to support 700 orphans in Uganda and they get uh, K through 12 education and they're almost all of them are going to U.S. universities and most of the kids that I met are going back to Uganda. They want to be part of rebuilding. Unfortunately, there's a semi-dictatorship but they're trying to rebuild the economy Um, I asked Teddy what was special about her just off the cuff and she said the most special thing about me is I'm still alive most of the kids that I met had lost 10, 20, 30 family members to AIDS there's 2 million AIDS orphans at the time I did this book 10 years ago Um, every town and village you walk into there's the coffin maker and a lot of them so there's, there's just a it was a massive, unbelievable crisis in Africa that you don't really hear or see that much anymore. 
But um, what they would say to me was, I said to this one girl who was 17, I said, you guys seem so positive, and, which they do. And when I saw them on stage at the Joyce Theater in New York, I was like, this is unbelievable. This is like the cliche because they're just transcendent. They're just transcending their pain and their suffering. And the dance is a way of expressing that. But it went beyond that because I went backstage and I met them. And that's why I went back to Africa with them to understand more and see where they lived and how they lived. And it was all about education for them. And this is what she said. She said, look, we draw a line of the past. You know, many of the kids were also, their families were killed by the Lord's Resistance Army, kidnapped and so forth. And they said, we draw a line. For us, it's all about where we're going to eat, where we're going to sleep, and where we're going to get our education, and we're building our future, and we live like that every day. This is Brian. He, at the time, was uh, 12 years old, and he asked me if I would take him back up into the war zone so he could find his father's grave. When the Lord's Resistance Army attacked his village and killed everyone in his family with machetes, he was rescued by a Ugandan army major and taken to this orphanage in Kampala where he began learning to dance. Um, but he had never been able to go back. So I took him back there and we found his father's grave and he found his brother he hadn't seen in six years. And uh, they were having peace talks, supposedly. This young man was also taken that night and was a, became a child soldier for seven years. And he was able to reunite with his aunts who hadn't seen him since he was gone. They assumed he was dead. This woman has AIDS, is dying of AIDS, and her daughter is in the orphanage. They've taken her in because the mother refuses to take her meds because she can't work. It makes her, the medications make her too sick, which is selling fish by the road. Bernard here is uh, one of the main dancers, and this is where his mother, who was a prostitute, left him in the middle of that road, and he grew up raised by the tailor who's inside that shop there who now makes all of these curtains and all of the, the props for the touring, world touring show from that dirt road. So that's, that was an incredible story for me. It really was, I didn't want to do this story because I thought I knew what I was going to find and what I expect, and I was so burned out on the horror. And I just couldn't believe the joy and the love and the power these kids had. And it was an epiphany for me to um, try to just live like they live. It's really hard. It's really, really hard, but every day. Oh, I did put Jane in, Jane Goodall. Wow. What did she do? Oh, she changed her perception of what it means to be human. <laughs> so she's 21 years old. She figures out that she sees the chimps have figured out how to use tools. She tells Leakey about it. She publishes a paper, and everyone says, you don't have a PhD. You're a girl. Forget about it. So what does she do? She goes back to England, gets her PhD, goes back and repeats the experiment and changes science and humanity forever. And she taught a lot of what she knows to Charlize. They actually battled the first week and then they really became buddies. I think I actually learned more about courage from Steve Jobs than anybody, ironically or oddly. This was in 1985. He'd been forced out of Apple, and he was determined to start over, and he announced he was going to build a supercomputer that would transform education. That got my attention and interest because I knew as a journalist that education was the source of every social issue, basically. And if he was going to do that, if Steve was going to work on that, that was worth getting interested in. I convinced him to let me have access for Life magazine. He gave me three years where I shattered him. He never did it before. He, hasn't done, he didn't do it after. Um, <coughs> to try to understand his process of innovation and working with his team. And I got inside that, that PR bubble and really saw this very interesting tribe of sort of naive idealists at that time. They really wanted to make tools to improve the world and they were willing to sacrifice everything for that, to be part of that mission to Mars. And some of the people, I ended up photographing 15 years at every major company or innovator in the Valley. And that's part of my new book that's out now. But the thing that, was really interesting was that they actually, some of them did die. Some of them actually died inventing the technology we completely take for granted today. It was so hard. That was step change innovation. Today, everything, it's innovative, we think, really innovative. It's iterations. Every single product we use today, from outer space to your kitchen, has its roots in the foundational work done in the 80s and 90s by the people I photographed, as it turns out. But what happened with Steve was this. I'd been kidnapped by rebels. I'd done this. I'd done that. 
Somehow, standing near Steve was terrifying. He could see right into your soul, your vulnerabilities. He knew instantly what made you tick, and he would use that to get you to do what he wanted. <laughs> I watched this, and I realized I could no longer hide behind my camera. Even though he trusted me and he gave me complete access, I knew someday he would turn on me, and I would have to justify what I was doing there. Everyone had to be the best in the world. Everyone had to be on top of their game. You had to know what you were doing. And believe me, I was very immature. I still am, but you don't have to grow up if you just live behind a camera. You don't have to deal with real life. You're just a witness. It's cool. You get a free pass. But Steve forced me to have an existential crisis. And, you know, I'd been trying to photograph pictures that would improve the world, change the world, bring light to injustice, whatever. You know, that was my attempt. Nothing had ha I hadn't done that yet. That hadn't happened for me. And I was willing to die for a picture that would do that. We all were. All my friends were. But then I realized, oh, right in front of me, here are the people that actually are changing the world. They actually are. All I got to do is show up and take pictures and make a record of their efforts. That's all I had to do. That became my purpose. That became my mission. As soon as I understood that, Steve was just a piece of cake. Not, not really. We only had one screaming fight, and I won that one. But. So this is at the end of 15 years. Samir Aurora is a serial entrepreneur, and his board is firing him. He thinks they're coming to give him more money, another round for his startup, but it's been five years of working around the clock. And unfortunately, Microsoft is in the space that they're in, and so the board feels they need to go in a new direction. Now, I shot 70 startups. Almost all of them failed, and I never once saw a VC stand up, I mean, a, a, a founder stand up to the VCs and say no, which he did. He refused to go, and they told him, Samir, you're crazy. You guys have been working, your team has been working around the clock for five years, they have shares. You wanna do the IPO, we're gonna shut you down if you don't quit and leave. We're gonna shut the company down. We're gonna cut off the funds. You're gonna to have to go in the next room and tell all those people that they're done. And he's like, I don't care. I have a vision, I'm not giving up. And you guys can go, blah, blah, blah. They did, they shut the company down. <laughs> He had to go give that speech, and he said, whoever can work for free, please stay. He went home over the weekend, started dialing to raise money. By noon Monday, he had $10 million in the bank, and he saved the company. And the best part of the story is, three months later, he sold the company to IBM for $100 million. They made a 1,000% return on their investment, these guys. They came back into the deal. And yeah, that was cool, but these guys were right, actually. <laughs> Microsoft was just killing everything that was existing. And about a year later, IBM took them public. And unfortunately, it was the height of a very nervous market. Every conversation was about, is the bubble going to burst? Well, it did. That was the day. They were the first company to close lower than they opened. It was March of 99. Every IPO after that was flat or down until March of 2000, when trillions of dollars washed away. At Apple, meanwhile, John Skelly grew the company after forcing Steve out from $800 million a year to $8 billion a year and started hiring women engineers and women managers. It was quite interesting. And I saw Sarah Clark with her ba have a baby, and she never left the building. She would breastfeed behind a curtain in her cube and sleep while her code was compiling. So while I was working on this book, I found these other pictures of women engineers, and I started to think, oh, why does diversity even matter? Social justice? Yeah, of course. But... It's also about power. Whoever writes the code controls the machine, which impacts your behavior and the entire culture. Worldview matters. Your priorities matter. What you think about, what you care about, comes out in the code and expresses itself in how the features. So that was cool. And here you go. So yeah, back in those days, it was an incredibly sexist environment. Women had to fight tooth and nail for every inch. Oh, wait, nothing's changed. This is one of the great, greatest philosophers today. We have Jaron Lanier, one of the pioneers of, of uh, virtual reality. He's like completely going against the grain, a contrarian in Silicon Valley, raising the, his hand and saying, Facebook and Google and all these silos of data, it's, it's total evil. He is standing up against all his friends and everybody in the community that he, you know, and he's now like a kind of an, he's a, he's a tolerated outcast. But he has been standing up and saying all of this stuff for the last 10 years that completely goes, flies in the face. And now we're seeing a retreat starting to turn because he's absolutely right. 
That's him. He's also a musician. <laughs> he did get kicked out of art. Yes, I forgot about that. I should have thrown that in. <laughs> so this is classic heroism. These guys were on the Arizona and Pearl Harbor, and they survived, and they saved their friends, and they did all this stuff, and one of them got the Congressional Medal of Honor. This is probably the highest symbol of courage we have in our country. And this guy is living in poverty, and he had it in a shoebox in Hawaii. Captain Ford, I, I don't think I have enough time to go through this, but he, he took off from Pearl Harbor just before they were bombed on his way to Auckland, New Zealand, and Japan had just basically taken over the whole Pacific, and he was told by Pan Am to fly around the world, so it was the first circumnavigation of the globe in a flying boat, which he did, coming back to New York. Okay, this is Tanzania. This is a story about river blindness. These women walked 10 miles from dawn to get to this village where they could have, they all have um, this bacteria in their eyes that turns their eyelashes inward and scrapes off the cornea and they go blind. So the cure, aside from an antibiotic, if they can't get that, is to cut their eyelashes off. So a local beautician does this surgery on an, like an open wooden table by the side of the dirt road, and they come and they have their eyelids cut off. And then they walk 10 miles back. This is before a surgery. I think you could make an argument that this is not so much about courage as owning a particular set of genes. You know, there was a study just recently showing that it could, that there's a, there's a correlation between a certain type of DNA and risk taking, you know, your, your, your lack of fear of death. But, you know, and I'll shoot anything with a camera in my hand, but when I shoot these people doing this stuff, I, had, I wanted to shoot a story about mountain climbers and they forced me to learn how to climb. <laughs> I'm so glad I don't do that anymore. But I was like, I can just shoot you from the top. They're like, no, you cannot shoot us unless you climb up that wall. So I learned and I climbed, but it was just living hell without a camera in my hand. I just couldn't, I have a horrible fear of heights. So, you know, I think every time they do this, there is a certain amount of choice and it is courage to some degree. Physical courage really is there. It's not necessarily going into a war zone, but they could easily die. On the other hand, they probably have some predisposition genetically to risk taking. This woman's daughter and her grandson were sent to prison for crack and she's raising her grandchildren. This woman's husband was uh, a Jew hunting Nazis in Germany until 1942, protected by the police, the, the Berlin Police Department, which he had been previously part of, his buddies helped him because they hated the Nazis too. She had an amazing story. She was also a witness to the Brazilian Revolution in 1930. And her son, her grandson there um, is a, went and served in the Israeli army and is now a great cinematographer. This is Auschwitz. And this is a survivor of Auschwitz. He has a tattoo and he's taking a weapons training course that the JDL was putting on in the desert outside LA to learn how to shoot. And never again was seriously what they were interested in. And um, they blindfolded me and drove me out to this secret range. This is, uh, you know, I put this in because of the faces. This is astonishing to see this. This is Birkenau, Auschwitz II, where they have these exhibits. You can see the shoes, the glasses, all the things that the Nazis took from the people. And this is a 17-year-old student from London on a school trip to visit Birkenau and Auschwitz. We had a really interesting conversation. This is Marina Silva, one of the great heroes of Brazil. She was there working with Chico, Chico Mendes. As a, she's a rubber tapper. She was born um, in the Amazon and she went on, you guys probably know all about her. She went on to become a senator and she was a minister of the environment. And I got to interview her to ask her about proverbs and sayings. This is a project I did on kids who stutter for a foundation and talk about heroism. These are some of the bravest, most beautiful kids I ever met. Just unbelievable overcoming that. This is in the Basque country 
1987, 50 years after the bombing of Guernica. This is in, the, in Bilbao. At that time, if you marched in public, you were liable to be shot. If you showed the Basque flag, you would be shot on sight. If you spoke the Basque language, you would be sent to prison for 12 years. And this was just uprising after uprising. Of course, they also had a really pretty effective terrorist organization. Um, but they found peace. Robin Williams. Got to know Robin a little bit over the years, had a few dinners, a few parties with him, and photographed him a number of times. And he had, a, he had two speeds, off or on. And when he was off, we didn't think about it, but he was always very, very serious and quiet. And now we know it was just the kind of depression that he was just battling his whole life. And my son, who is my true hero, who was born with a number of learning disabilities and motor skill issues. His, Two hemispheres weren't connected. And he had to go through massive physical therapy to grow neural pathways so he could run and hold a pencil. And he went through this really sad childhood where he was the lonely kid on the, on the playground where no one would play with him. And he couldn't recognize facial emotion. He didn't know friend from foe, so he always looked really angry. And he went through all this stuff, and guess what? He worked his way through it, figured workarounds, and graduated college with a record deal, went on the road and was a singer. And anyway, now he's in Japan getting his, uh, finished his master's in Japanese. Anyway, I love this kid. He's a good kid. He's the opposite of me when I was his age. I think living your authentic self, especially when love is politicized, can take the greatest courage. And in the end, this discussion for me leads to mystery, this strange, sometimes beautiful, absurd mystery of life. And you know, being alive, for me, it means living with ambiguity, with uncertainty, and doubt. So what do you learn from these people? Mostly you learn to try to follow their example when it's your turn. The bottom line, what I learned from my subjects about courage is that we need to make meaning out of our lives every day. To make our lives meaningful to ourselves. This means finding your purpose, your passion, your mission. It means aligning your values with what you love doing and how you make a living. The fallacy is that we have time, that you will have time. You can compromise your dreams to gain financial or career security. You think once you get that, then you'll take the time to sort out what you really want to do with life. I get that. I've seen that. I've thought about that. And to believe in yourself and your own ideas, though, against all evidence to the contrary, is extremely risky. So, in fact, you'll probably fail if you do that. But without taking the risk to be who you want to be, you will never accomplish your dreams. Your dreams. You'll be living that life of quiet compromise and having a midlife crisis 30 years from now. I promise you. <sighs> so finding your true path and taking that path takes courage every single day. Thank you.